Welcome to part two of Enochian Secrets of the World's Oldest Text. This is a reading of my first published book, The Lost Scriptures of Giza. If you have not yet listened to part one, the link is in the description box. The Egyptian Coptic translation of the Pistis Sophia is merely the translation of an older translation. The earliest known copy of the text was in Greek, naturally, as it was an Alexandrian writing, and this is easily ascertained due to the abundant Greek words left untranslated in the Coptic manuscript. In fact, the majority of ancient manuscripts extant today are but translations of translations and rarely are texts found in their original language. The first book of Yao reveals that Yao dwells in the center of heaven as the eons revolve around him. He is the first mystery. From his position at the treasury of light was a gate to the regions of the three Amens. Amen signifies the hidden one, here representing him by the number three. The Gnostics cleverly called him by the acronym IO. This is the combining of Alpha and Omega prefixed with the determinative for the Hebrew Yah or Jah. The Pista Sophia claims that Enoch learned the books of Yah at a holy mountain but then also that he learned them from the tree of Gnosis, or knowledge. Disparity, or an admission that both are the same thing. As there stand two gigantic pyramids at Giza in alignment with one another, geometrically and geodetically, with the cardinal directions, we find that there are only two books of Yao. While there stands a third member at the Great Pyramids of Giza, the third is fundamentally different than the two gigantic pyramids. It was called the Red Pyramid, is much smaller with less mass. It was covered in beautiful limestone with inscriptions like the other two. It must also be noted here that in the Genesis account, the Tree of Knowledge was of good and evil. The fall of man was partially due to a newfound awareness of evil and man's capacity to succumb to it. But this acquisition of information was not entirely to our detriment, for God provided a balance, a gnosis of good and evil knowledge, the good concealed and divine mysteries that serve to aid the diligent researcher in getting to the tree of life, the embodiment of the word of God. The mysteries of the Gnostics lead us to the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, wherein we discover that the tenth heaven was where God dwells, which in Hebrew tongue is called Aravat. This is probably the rock of Ararat mentioned in the Pistis Sophia that is protected by an archon. The mountain commonly known as Ararat is not in Egypt at all, but Armenia and which is modern Turkey, popular for being the landing place of the Ark of Noah after the Great Flood. Ararat may have been the actual name known to the pre-flood peoples given to the Great Pyramid, and as Noah would have known all about the monument, which was still being constructed when he was born, he may have named the mountain Ararat when the vessel came to a stop. At Giza, the primary architectural features are the two huge pyramids, the third and smaller red pyramid, the Sphinx, but there are seven other smaller pyramid structures alongside the Great Pyramids. Altogether, on the Giza Plateau are ten pyramids, a sum very significant to the Hebrew mystics, which held that it signified perfect completion and was the number for God. Remarkably, Ten is the third and most important triangular number of the Kabbalists and the Pythagoreans. Early methods of counting led to a discovery. Different amounts of stones put together formed different shapes. The numbers three, six, and ten form triangular numbers and are derived themselves from unique mathematical formula. 
1 plus 2 equals 3. 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 6. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10. 10 was considered the supreme and divine equation. Philus of Tarentum wrote that this number was the embodiment of perfection and the shape of the triangle was believed to contain the unutterable name of God. Though we have seen how the word pyramid means pillar of fire, the Coptics went so far as to claim that this was derived from pyramid, or a tenth part of numbers. The reference here to the name of God hidden within the shape of the triangle calls to mind the early Masonic records early, earlier examined that claimed that Enoch built a temple before the flood that contained an agate triangle that hid the name of God. This tradition was no, now, no doubt borrowed from the exact beliefs of the Greeks. Some of the reasoning of the old writers may have been slightly warped, such as Philo's opinion that the number 10 was perfect because the tops of mountains, after the deluge being pointed, appeared in the number of the decade, or the triangle. But this alone does not negate the significance in the parallels between various texts and cultures in the belief of this number's importance and relation to God. Because our most remote ancestors refused to call God by any earthly name, the pyramid served as the perfect glyphic representation of the deity because it was a three-sided figure, an image of the, of the lost holy mountain. He was simply referred to as the nameless. In titles like El, Yah, Adonai, the Lord, and the Eternal, or Maker, were merely employed to describe him. In the very old writings of India, known as the Rig Veda, we read, Though one, he is called by the learned by many names. His name was so sacred that it could not be uttered by the human tongue, so our earliest priest and prophets fashioned epithets to describe him and artisans molded wonderful glyphic representations. Among one of the most curious of these symbols designated to represent the name of the great giver of light among the Egyptians, Mexicans, and other civilizations of antiquity was a pyramid, a triangle. One of the most intriguing aspects early theologians attached to that of God was that he was a door. For this reason, the symbolic representation of the name of God as a triangle also took on the meaning of gate or door. In the Hebrew and Phoenician alphabets, the triangle, the letter Daleth, also meant door, being the fourth letter, a symbol also found on the famous Moabite stone. The Egyptian determinative for door was the same, was the same being a triangle, Mr or Mer. Because gates and doors connect different areas, some cultures affix different meanings to the glyphs. According to the Imperial Dictionary of King He of China, the triangle is a sign of union. It was Jacob who erected the pillar of stone and called it the gate or door of heaven, the pillar identifying the more expansive symbol of the holy mountain that unifies heaven and earth. This mountain is the door represented by God who alone provides access. The Egyptian mirror, also myrrh, seems to have been preserved throughout the lower Pacific Oce uh, Oceanic Islands in Melanesia, Polynesia, Micronesia, where are found numerous pyramidal structures on the island chains universally known as Meri. As found in John Macmillan Brown's research in his epic work, The Riddle of the Pacific. Again, the similarity with Meru, the mountain at the center of the world, cannot be ignored. That a divine mountain connecting our world to both the heavens and the underworld, a place that was accessible to us long ago, is a constant theme of the ancients. Such a location is also alluded to in the 2nd millennium B.C. text known as the Enuma Elish, or Seven Tablets of the Babylonian Creation Epic. The Babylonian hero, hero was Marduk, who went to battle against a powerful demonic lord named Kingu. 
a war deity allied to the chaos dragon Tiamat, who resided in the deep. Kingu robbed the Lord High God, then named Enlil, of the Tablets of Destinies that contained the eternal truths of the past, present, and future, but the hero Marduk wrested them away from the Demon Lord. Marduk would later destroy Tiamat with a weapon that looked like the Labrys of ancient times, a pitchfork facing up and down. After defeating Kingu, Marduk then made a gate to the deep so the hordes of demons and King, and King Gu could not steal from Enlil again. He bolted the gate shut and set a watchman, a watcher, guardian over it to ensure that the evil waters of chaos would not rise again. Here we have the retold, albeit earlier, story of the prehistoric theft of the heavenly knowledges and their restoration on earth. The Tablets of Destinies is akin to the Tree of Knowledge, or the Books of Yao, and the Watcher is the Archon named Kalapatoroth, represented by the Guardian Sphinx, the same Guardian placed there by Surid before the Flood, our Enoch in the ancient Coptic texts. This gate to the underworld is also found within the writings of the Jewish historian Josephus, who 2,000 years ago wrote that the Sethite erected the pillars in Syriad, Egypt. Josephus wrote concerning the lake of unquenchable fire and where it lies hidden that there is one descent into this region, at whose gate we believe there stands an archangel with a host. Which gate? when those pass through that are conducted down by the angels that are appointed over souls. The archangel would again be identified as the Sphinx, which was long ago known to be the composite of a lion, bull, man, and eagle, identifying the ancient tetramorph, or four divine archangels of the book of Revelation that usher in the apocalypse. The Sphinx, with the face of a man, body of a calf or bull, the paws of a feline, a lion, also long ago had painted along its flanks the wings of an eagle. Josephus does not claim that this gate to the underworld is the Giza complex, but nor does he cite where this descent is located. As a historian borrowing his information from many older sources available to him two millennia ago, we must consider these fragments in light of other glimpses and fragmented texts because all accounts of the Great Pyramid Complex have been passed down from times after the Flood Cataclysm by cultures that in themselves only preserve various parts of the whole. Because today we have access to so many of these fragmented beliefs, we are beginning to put back together the pieces of this astonishing arcanum, parts of the whole even found within the Holy Scriptures among the particularly old Psalms. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully? Lift up your hands, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. This is in the Psalms. There are many other scriptures we'll be getting into that show glimpses of the Great Pyramid and its relation to God and being a gate. The Mysterious Relation to the Number Seven The pyramid was also used by the Egyptians as a numeral, the hieroglyph representing the number seven. Because the symbol is a representation of the three-dimensional triangle or pyramid, we find the Egyptian glyph simple yet sophisticated. The triangle had three sides, but the pyramid has four faces, and the imagery combines here to account for the seven. This number was considered divine, a holy number that identified time itself. The phenomenon of time was linked to the motion of the celestial bodies, 
perfectly understood by, by the Egyptians. They religiously watched the movements of the planets called wanderers and gods, for it was believed that their movements affected things on earth, such as droughts, famines, invasions, periods of peace, victory, or even death. Their own beliefs in this respect were no different than those of the Near East and abroad. Diodorus wrote that the Chaldeans believed that every event in the heavens has its meaning as part of the eternal scheme of divine forethought. During these early epics of astrology, it was a type of religious astronomy and the universal mode of communication understood by all the sages and scribes of different cultures was by numbers, a language of universal application. The number seven was of particular importance to these astrotheologies. There were only seven known celestial bodies in the creation, not among the fixed and unmovable stars. These were the wanderers, the planets of our solar system and the sun and moon. The five known planets were thought to be divine beings because they on their own volition moved against the backdrop of starry hosts that seemed implacable and fixed in their passing close to earth or their conjunction with another planet often signified great portents or divine revelations. The sun and moon were used to tabulate the more popular calendrical systems, but lesser known time timekeeping methods recording the cyclic conjunction of the planets were employed to record the approach and passing of the great year, a 600 year period fully explained in my other, other work, The Return of the Fallen Ones. The Chaldeans of Babylon pictorially represented their concept of time being symbolized by the number seven, which was divided into three distinct parts solar, lunar, and stellar, like this Chaldean star depicted in the illustration. This geometrical calendar demonstrates how time, though measured in sevens, is continual. The end of the seven-day cycle of the week here depicted by the sun, moon, and five planets ends with the seventh planet. However, the seventh pointed pattern is not complete until the eighth day is reached which incidentally is the first of the seven days of another cycle. For this reason, the number eight, for at least 3,000 years in the mysteries and by numerologists, has been the number for new beginnings. The one and the eight are synonymous when the number seven is geometrically depicted. We find this maintained even as late as the Christian apocryphal writings, such as the Epistle of Barnabas, which reveals that after the seven ages of the world pass, God says, I shall begin the eighth day, that is, the beginning of the other world. Perhaps this is but a memory of the older Book of Enoch, which conveys that there are seven weeks, or ages of earth history, followed by an eighth week of universal peace and harmony. In the Genesis account, the world was renovated from the ruin of chaos in six days, but the seventh day indicated a day of rest, inactivity of God. However, it required an eighth day, which is actually the first now, in order for another week to follow. The Babylonian Enema Elish was written in cuneiform upon seven tablets and tells of the seven stages of con conflict that resulted in the creation and establishment of Marduk as supreme among the gods. It is widely known that the Book of Genesis creation account was copied from the Enema Elish document. But an eighth stage clearly must follow to verify that anything was indeed established. Though the number 10 is holy and heavenly, the number 7 seems to refer to perfection on earth. We were made from elements of the earth, and on earth the spectrum of light as perceived on the human visual bandwidth is divided into seven primary colors, what we call the rainbow, the glass prism dividing ordinary sunlight. Even in music, the completion of seven tones brings one back to the exact same note, but an octave higher. The Latin word octave meaning eight. 
It is not without design that our present numeral for the number eight appears in such a way as to have no beginning or end. An infinity symbol. The deeper we delve into the secrets of nature and the mechanics of God's creative work, we find that numbers indeed provide us many amazing revelations. Not only did God create or renovate everything in seven days, but according to the revelation, he shall destroy the civilizations of the world by the repetitions of seven. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven mysterious thunders, and the seven vials, or the bowls of wrath, will be affected against the earth and the seven-headed dragon of chaos, symbolic for the seven demonic kings, will be vanquished at the end of the seventh age before he ushers in the eighth age, or millennial earth. Thus, the number seven is a terrestrial number relative to humanity and the world we live in, a number embodying the concept of time. The seven-pointed calendar star was also known to the Norse and the Celts. Amazingly, their depiction parallels the seemingly older model used by the Chaldeans and employed the use of runes. Runes were a part of the sacred alphabet that the Norse believed was a gift from the gods of their ancestors and they were believed to have divine properties. For this reason, they were used sparingly. The Celtic calendar mirrors the function of the Chaldean one perfectly. The two are identical and conclusive evidence that they share a common belief, if not a common origin. The seven points represent the seven days of the week, and their runes identify other properties, real or imagined, that were enjoyed by the days they signified. One thing of interest concerning the Celtic version is the rune of the seventh day, a rune encapsulated within a pyramid symbol. This is beyond coincidence. The Celtic priests, be they druids or others, must have related the triangle to the concept of time. In Lost Language of Symbolism, published over a hundred years ago, we are shown old symbols of representing the spiritual fire of the universe, which, surprisingly, is associated with the soul's goal of ascent. The spiritual fire is shown to have seven points of flame connected by a thin pillar of three dots. In the next archive and later in this book, the significance of this symbol will become more and more comprehensible as it reveals a connection to three stars and the inner architectural alignments of the Great Pyramid. These seven points have been associated in ancient artwork to a dragon's head. This would be the dragon's head of Alpha Draconis, the pre-flood pole star in the Draco constellation, a circumpolar constellation. The horns, artistically, be they of a bull or a dragon, identify the two pillars that mark the path to the entrance to eternity. This is why this representation must be of a dragon. The pole star was considered the celestial gate of God in the realms of heaven, and Draco had dutifully guarded that area of the heavens, whereas Taurus horns are nowhere near the ancient pole star, but in the zodiacal belt. The stunning alignments within the Great Pyramid as seen in the next archive make this the more plausible interpretation. There has been confusion in older books as to the identity of the two horns, be they of Taurus or of the dragon. The very earliest appearance of the seven-pointed star is found upon an archaic Assyrian Babylonian seal that depicts a man in reverence to a pillar that stands upon a solid foundation. The pillar has a ladder painted upon it, and the pillar has above it a seven-pointed star glyph. Intriguingly, the ladder has eight rungs. This symbolic ladder, seen in the illustration, is the same as that venerated by the mystics called Scala Perfectionist, or Ladder of Perfection, the favorite emblems representing the roadway to the gods. This ancient seal conveyed that somewhere on earth, typified by the foundation stone, was a gateway, possibly in the form of a stone monument, typified by the pillar symbol, that opens up to heaven, typified by the ladder, 
which would open at a designated time, typified by the seven-pointed star, known only to God, inferred by the placement of the star over the pillar. This seal, which was a visual description of the personal faith and belief of the owner, probably depicts himself as the man shown in the seal. He knew that time itself much must reach an eighth part before he could obtain this hope of gaining access from earth to heaven. The monument alluded to in the seal is the Great Pyramid, the stone image of the terrestrial number seven. It is the pillar or the gateway that will one day open, merging the world we know now with the world that will come. So it should come as no surprise to learn that the standard measurement used in the geometry of the pyramids of Giza was time itself. In a unique work titled Beginnings, the Sacred Design by author Bonnie Gaunt, she exhibits a startling discovery. An avid researcher into the mysteries of numbers and biblical gematria and how they coincide with the features of the Great Pyramid, Gaunt made the connection between the exterior and interior passage angles of the Great Pyramid surface, surfaces, which are sloped at 51 to 52 degrees. The ascending passage and descending passage are both angled within the monument at 26 degrees. So the angles of the two passage systems going up and down from each other are 52 degrees. And in geometry, only the heptagram or the seven-pointed star produces the 52-degree angle. The exterior sloping angle of the Great Pyramid at 52 degrees was a problem for the ancient Egyptians. After the completion of the Giza structures, no other pyramids in the world replicated this 52-degree angle. Egyptologists are at a loss to explain away this discrepancy, fancying to ignore all evidence that promotes the view that the Giza monuments may have not been erected by the ancient Egyptians as we have been force-fed to believe for so long. There were many attempts to copy the angle, but all met with disastrous results. Many are the mounds of stone along the Nile River that were once pyramid projects. Some were never even finished. A couple of these projects were documented to have collapsed during construction. The unit of measurement employed in the laying out of the Giza pyramids was a solar unit, meaning that the unit of measurement employed in building the Great Pyramid was Earth-Sun commiserate. Presently, it takes our planet 365.25 days to circle the Sun always traveling along the orbital belt at an average distance away from it at about 93 million miles away. This is a vast ring we travel. Whether this is a simulated holography or an actual Newtonian system, the math doesn't change. It's one we call a year. And when we divide this year of 365.25 by 52, we get 7.02. Thus, 52 days is the duration by which it takes our world to move one-seventh of its distance through the year. This alone should be cause enough for the serious consideration of a non-Egyptian origin for these structures. Men may have built the Great Pyramids, but they did not design them. A greater intellect was wor at work here, one that gave divine instructions to Enoch and his people. The sun is the unit, or medium, by which we measure days and years, and it is vitally important to the earth and all living things. If there be any who have read this far and still believe that men of old on their own initiative could have designed this colossi, the next archive was written for you. The Great Pyramid was erected in such a fashion as to never be duplicated. Ruinous pyramids around the world are all enduring testaments to mankind's inability to replicate the works of God. The seven-pointed star, according to Gerald Massey in the 1880s, as published in his lectures, 
page 235, was the sign of the pyramid and was known to the early Egyptians who called it Harkuti, or Lord of Lights, sometimes as Lord of the Glorified Elect. It was related to the Egyptian concept of the Eternal Word. It would indeed be a remarkable thing to believe that the Great Pyramid was a stone prophecy of the redemption of mankind, filled with numerous geometrical mysteries, and when translated into rectilinear timelines, accurately depicts all of the major events in human history with precision. To find it not mentioned at all in the Holy Writ would be unbelievable. This would be a severe blow to this thesis. The fact that the internal architectural geometry is actually a world history timeline has been the subject of several books dating back to 1860, but these earlier authors were led by intuition and inaccurate chronologies of world history or inaccurate measurements, so they were forced to fit facts where they should have been as opposed to where they are. If the reader seeks to examine the utterly fascinating proof that the Great Pyramid is a calendar of man's past and future, I have provided these in my series of, of videos in the playlist, The Lost Secrets of Giza. But as to the biblical records and their apparent silence concerning this monument, this is untrue. As seen earlier, Zion was a direct reference to the Giza complex, and indirectly, the pyramids are mentioned as pillars in the scriptures. But there is one reference that conclusively refers to the Great Pyramid and no other. In the book of the prophet Ezekiel 29.10, we read of the north-south dimensions of Egypt. God reveals that in the future, long after the 8th century B.C., Egypt would be laid waste, the entire country from the Tower of Syene even unto Ethiopia. The Tower of Syene actually translates to the Tower of Seven. Additionally, the stone which was quarried to build the Great Pyramid has long, long ago by geologists been known to have been taken from the Syene quarries. Thus, the description, the Tower of Seven, in the scriptures reveals also the source of the stones themselves. The ridiculous argument put forth by some critics that the Tower of Syene is a reference to the Pharos lighthouse off the coast of Alexandria is anachronistic. The Ezekiel text is far older, antedating the construction of the famous lighthouse by centuries. The geographical borders of Egypt of old were, were from the Giza area, including Memphis all the way south, past Thebes, or Old Waset, to the borders of Ethiopia. The more we learn about this monument, the more we are confronted with deeper mysteries. This was acknowledged by some unnamed sage very long ago, for inside the pyramid, someone had written, I am the herald and witness of God. He created me with human feelings and deposited a mystery within me. This was not an original inscription belonging to the monument, but placed there by someone evidently aware of the purpose of this architectural marvel. There is much more we are not told about the Great Pyramid, information concealed by historians and scholars because they have, what they have found is not consistent with, they, with what they themselves have been taught or employed to propagate. There is a nigh impenetrable mystery about the Gazean monuments that begs the question, why is there so little known about them? Archive 3, The Great Pyramid of Enoch, Writing on the Wall At Akuzan and Syriad, before the flood, the Sethites erected the Gazean monuments, covering them with texts of the wisdom, discoveries of their time, and the knowledge of astronomy and the future. The Great Pyramid was a type of time capsule that protected and concealed an advanced yet original theology that was taken for granted by mankind in the antediluvian civilization. Upon the Colossi were placed writings ordained by the Creator given through Enoch for the purpose of surviving the destruction of the world. 
These were the secrets of the distant past, the present, and the worlds to come after the deluge and far beyond even into the years of the apocalypse and millennial period. As the largest book in the world, it has remained virtually intact even 48 centuries after its construction. The Greek and Roman historians, geographers, and writers 2,000 years ago and before perplexed over these monuments, gigantic works in the desert of Egypt. Many of them left to posterity their observations and their writings. Their findings greatly contribute to our understanding of how the Great Pyramid originally appeared before it was defaced. By the testimony of ancient writers, the lower portions of the structure were covered with millions of tiny inscriptions that by the time of the Greeks were already impossible to translate. Most of the information we have studied concerning the writings up to the faces of the Great Pyramid have come from Hebraic, Egyptian, and various other traditions, but they were made believable by their correspondences, and we are not without substantiation from even old, more credible authorities now. As far back as 440 BC, the Greek historian and traveler Herodotus of Halicarnassus eventually wandered into Egypt after traversing the Near East. He sought whatever knowledge he could gather from the antiquarian priesthoods of Egypt. It was there that he, was in, that he in awe beheld the majesty of the Great Pyramid. The account of his visual scrutiny of the edifice conveys that the casing stones were polished and white and covered in writings. He marveled that these casing blocks were perfectly fit together and polished. Herodotus wrote that the joints between the casing stones were so close together as to scarcely be seen at all. Almost 400 years later, another famous scholar traveled to Egypt, Diodorus Siculus, who wrote that the Great Pyramid was indeed covered in beautiful white casing blocks. He further remarked that the structure possibly lacked a capstone. A few decades after Diodorus, the historian Strabo visited Giza in 24 BC and was struck by the enormity of the magnificent building. He too claimed that the monument was encased in white casing stones. Strabo wrote that the Great Pyramid was like a building let down from heaven, untouched by human hands. This is a startling statement, for in his days, the structure was already 27 centuries old. Strabo also wrote that the Egyptian priest knew of a secret door into the monument, a curiously hinged door, disguised among the casing blocks on the north face of the structure that led into a descending corridor. Though this entrance has been rediscovered, there is evidence that the Egyptians had long before forgotten where it was located. This evidence is in the fact that there has never been found any authentic ancient Egyptian writings, relics, or objects inside the Great Pyramid. This is a topic for a later section. That the secret entrance could have been easily lost is now known because of its obscure placement on the north face, high up on the sloping face and not centered so as to prevent detection. Evidently, the priests for a long time passed down the tradition of the secret entrance, though they had lost its location. The Egyptians also told Herodotus that there was a chamber below the pyramid that would fill up with water from the Nile, but this, too, is but an elder knowledge passed down from earlier times when the secret door's location was known. As will be shown, Many pyramid-building cultures preserve this knowledge that a well or water source lied beneath the structure. Strabo's observation concerning the pyramid's appearance as a building let down from heaven is a very accurate description of the optical illusion created by the size of the monument when viewed from a great distance. Long ago, when it was covered by gleaming white limestone, amid a barren landscape of desert yellow and brown, the heat of the daytime sun on the dead earth visibly obscured the lower portions of the monument. Far away, the pyramid appeared to be floating above the solid earth, disconnected to it. 
As one drew closer to the structure, it would literally descend onto the plateau until the observer was close enough that he could see that it was indeed firmly set on the ground. The highly polished and precision placed white casing blocks in the nearby reservoirs of water channeled in from the Nile amplified the effect. Pilgrims and visitors were always amazed to discover that the mountain that they, they witnessed from such great distances was actually covered in a numerous smooth white stones seemingly appearing as if they were one gigantic block and that the structure was on the ground. From even up close, the Great Pyramid once looked like it was all hewn from a single immense white stone. Before the Diluvian catastrophe that ended the ancient world, the geographical area, what was to become Egypt, was the center of knowledge, learning, and Sethite civilization in the world. In a unique parallel, after the flood, this region again became the center of knowledge shrouded in the most arcane mysteries. The Sethites encoded divine secrets into the architectural alignments inside and outside the Great Pyramid, the lesser structures, the Sphinx, and the huge temples. They inscribed myriads of text upon its surface and also concealed an ancient library of important writings below the Giza Plateau. Though the Egyptian people had been conquered by Amalekites, by Hittites, Amorites, Babylonians, Assyrians, Elamites, all through their history, the Nile civilization was still venerated for having cultural centers of learning in their various temple cities that had no parallels in the rest of the Near East and Mediterranean world. This status remained true even until the Macedonian occupation of, of Greece, Asia Minor, the entire Eastern Mediterranean, Persia, and Egypt. Egypt as a center of learning flourished under the Ptolemies, also Macedonian, and after Alexander the Great became king of Greece, Tyre, Babylon, Persia, and Egypt, the city of Alexandria was constructed on the Mediterranean and made famous for its incredible library that housed over half a million texts and records. Alexandria became the cosmopolitan admixture of Egyptians, Ionian Greeks, Greeks, Romans, Syrians, Carthaginians, Persians, Jews, people from India, and even Ro uh, Romanized and Grecianized Celts and Gauls. Strabo studied there among the halls of 750,000 texts, all very meticulously numbered and cataloged, according to Manley P. Hall in his thought-provoking work, Wisdom of the Ancient Ones. Many of the writings preserved in the halls of Alexandria were actually old cosmographies and writings copied from copies, translations of translations that find their ultimate origin as tiny inscriptions once adorning the lower casing stones of the Great Pyramid. An entire archive later in this book has been devoted to show this. These writings were translated and copied during the life of Abraham, Holy scriptures and books of wisdom and prophecy preserved by various cultures and known today as the religious writings of dozens of archaic cultures around the world. The Roman historian Ammianus Marcellinus, a Greek by birth in the 4th century AD, wrote about the Great Pyramid claiming that its builders knew of a great flood coming on the world, so they dug out deep fissures to preserve the memory of their ceremonial knowledge. His statement was not novel, but the general consensus of all Alexandrian scribes who had access to the histories and chronologies of the world that was no longer extant. It was at Alexandria where scholars produced through patient labor the famous Septuagint translation of the books of Moses in the 3rd century BC. This was the books Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. By the 2nd century AD, they had completed a translation of the entire Old Testament into Greek. Later, the Romans destroyed much of the library, but Mark Antony, famed lover of Queen Cleopatra, built the Library of Pergamene at Alexandria afterwards, which held over 200,000 texts. Many since then are responsible for the library's ultimate demise, from invasions of Romans, Visigoths, Christian religious purgings, and fanaticism, and even Muslim occupation of the city. During these tumultuous times, many of the texts were secreted away by land and by sea to reappear in hundreds or thousands of personal caches 
elves in smaller libraries in Europe, Asia, and Arabia. The scholars of the Arabians that filtered into Egypt to study the pyramids and their later counterparts also left us records of their findings that verify the observances made by the older Greek and Roman writers. Masaudi left us the Coptic traditions of Surid, uh, Egyptian Coptic Enoch, studied earlier concerning the building of the pyramids. However, this scholar also conducted his own research of the Giza site. Masaudi's manuscript is preserved in the British Museum as document 9575, which tells that the faces of the Great Pyramid were inscribed with unknown and unintelligible writings of people and nations of forgotten antiquity, a fact corroborated by the writings of Ibu Hakel. Another Arab historian whose name has been lost to us recorded that the surfaces of the two gigantic pyramids at Giza were covered in inscriptions from top to bottom and that the lines of text were very close together but nearly erased with time. He claimed that the meanings of the writings upon the casing stones was not known. Such an admission conveys that the inscriptions were very old because the Arab scholars of the time were among the world's intelligentsia versed in Aramaic, Coptic, Hebrew, Latin, Syrian, Greek, and some even studied ancient cuneiform and hieroglyphics. Being una unable to translate a script is one thing, but not being capable of even identifying the writings is quite another. A fact indicating that the inscriptions upon the Great Pyramid were of one of truly ancient languages, probably Sumerian. As will be seen in this book, there is a considerable amount of evidence that the Great Pyramid was indeed covered in Sumerian pictographs, which were translated after the flood in the days of the patriarch of biblical fame called Abraham. Tiny inscriptions grouped in lines close together over all four faces of the Great Pyramid, possibly over the surfaces of the other pyramid as well, would be the most extensive ancient library in the world, the largest book. On Earth, Had these writings been to in any known post-Diluvian language, then there would have been many accounts of their contents. Even the Arab chronicler Makrizi wrote that it was not known who built these monuments, and he wrote that everything connected to them was mysterious. The traditions respecting them were various and contradictory. These are the records of respectable historians regarding the writings of Giza. These men saw these monuments as they were intended to be seen, and they are to be envied for this privilege. What we behold at Giza today is not comparable to the awe-inspiring majesty of the sight that they had witnessed. Later historians tell us why. Beneath the Casing Stones the great Arabian scholars that have contributed so much to the preservation of many records concerning the Great Pyramid are not to blame for the desecration of this most sacred site. It was their Muslim counter contemporaries who are to blame for the reason these gigantic pyramids appear naked today. It was because of their hunger for newer building materials that no no human for the past six and a half centuries has laid eyes upon the monument as it was supposed to be seen. Today, only a bare complex remains, bereft of its glorious mantle of highly polished white limestone casing blocks, covered in minute writings that dazzled the ancient pilgrims who journeyed to see it and confounded the learned. In the year 1356 AD, a devastating earthquake toppled many of the buildings in the Muslim city of Cairo near, near Giza. It was prior to this in 1301 and 1302 that a series of earthquakes had damaged the casing blocks on the Great Pyramid. Muslim engineers had the local populace strip off the immense white limestone blocks from off the Great Pyramid and then haul them a few miles to Cairo to rebuild the wasted city. This was not an easy task. It took decades. The stone was redressed and cut and even today, as late as as, as late as 2022, still stand some of the white mosques made from the stolen stone of the world's most ancient sacred site. It took the Muslims several decades to remove all the stone facing blocks and the work left behind hills of broken rock all around the Great Pyramid. 
The surface area of the pyramid's faces covers 22 acres of the blocks, 144,000 in number. These blocks were 100 inches thick. Almost 200 years later, the Turks were still stripping the casing blocks left behind. Also, after an earthquake that had occurred in 1517. So completely had these people defaced these monuments that debates centuries later raged among the world scholars and historians over the existence of these casing stones. The pyramids were laid bare, stripped of their magnificent covering, being removed, exposed their internal structures to everyone. Levels and levels of darker limestone blocks. Though the Egyptian hieroglyphic determinatives seem to indicate the presence of tiny writings toward the base of the Great Pyramid, for over three centuries not a single white limestone casing block had been found at the Giza site. This hieroglyphic picture reveals that the pyramid had either a capstone or was intended to have one. The Great Pyramid today does not have one. The 52 degree angle of the monument and the smoothness of the casing blocks would have prevented anyone long ago from climbing its faces. Because the inscriptions were very small in lines packed closely together, it is possible or probable that the early Egyptians did not know that these writings ascended to the very top. Just as there is also a good chance that they only covered the lower third of the, st of the structure's face. The Arabs and Turks left the base of the pyramids buried in rock rubble from their decades-long extraction campaign of the casing blocks. Enormous piles of stone refuse, and it was not until the year 1837 that any serious archaeological excavation was conducted there. At that time, the British Colonel Vice and his crews cleared away the piles of rubble and looked upon the foundation level of the Great Pyramid for the first time in over 480 years. They ended the debate, for miraculously, Colonel Vice not only found the Great Pyramid's original base level, but also discovered original casing blocks in situ still attached to the structure. The white limestone casing blocks had been buried under the rubble. Their rediscovery in 1837 validates the ancient historian's testimonies. These few blocks were weathered badly and damaged by their burial, but their smooth faces and geometrical perfection demonstrate the unbelievable level of sophistication required to manufacture just one of them. At this point, one would naturally ask, and rightfully, if there were any inscriptions found upon the few remaining blocks? The answer is no. The casing blocks discovered were at the very base of the monument, the lowest level, adjoining to the actual limestone plateau. It is not known if the writings were ever on those blocks. However, assuming that inscriptions were present at one time, we must also consider that these lowest blocks would have had the most exposure from millennia of sandblasting. They were within human reach, were under the immense pressure of the rising and moving floodwaters of the deluge and the runoffs that occurred for years afterward, the flooding of the Nile and Delta and the touching and kissing of the stones by millions of pilgrims that visited the holy site, similar to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. It is quite possible that over a billion people in the last 4,000 years alone have touched the lower blocks. Many others copied the inscriptions they found upon the surfaces, and still others had written their own names and dates on the stone. We cannot ignore that the early Greeks and Arabs wrote that the writings were in their day still perceptible, albeit almost erased with time. These writings were not engraved upon the casing blocks by all accounts. They were smooth as still water. These writings were perhaps burned by some unknown technique or painted. According to Tony Bushby, as related in his well-researched book, The Secret in the Bible, samples taken from these surviving white limestone casing blocks were sent to the prestigious Norbonne University in France, and careful analysis by chemical and spectrographic examination of the fragments determined that there was a film of paint once present on their surfaces. We have to surmise that the painting used was as sophisticated as the monument itself. These casing blocks were massive, about 100 inches thick and weighing several tons. 
William Corliss in Ancient Structures wrote that they were of complex shape, smoothly finished, and formerly held in a very thin layer of cement of great strength and unknown formula. Even the scrutiny of modern science cannot decipher the mysteries of this monument. We are not much further in comprehending these megaliths as was Herodotus 24 centuries ago. In Herodotus' internationally famous book, The Histories, Book 2, 124, we read that he was told by Egyptians that the structures were built in, in three monthly shifts of 100,000 men each, and that it took 10 years of oppressive la slave labor to build the track along which the blocks would be hauled. He was told of the underground sepulchral chambers under the plateau that the pyramid took 20 years to build and was covered in polished stone blocks beautifully fitted. He was shown inscriptions on the structure and was told by Egyptians that the writings explained the amount of funds expended in feeding the men that constructed the complex. The entire episode is doubtful. Even Herodotus expressed his doubt in the story. He wrote, and I remember distinctly, that the interpreter who read me the inscription said the sum of 1,600 talents of silver. If this is true, how much must have been spent in addition on bread and clothing for the laborers during all those years the building was going on? Not to mention the time it took to quarry and haul the stone and to construct the underground chamber. Mathematicians have estimated that there were exactly 144,000 casing blocks on the Great Pyramid alone. They, have several, they are several tons each and similar to marble in hardness, though they are limestone. Though divine, celestial and terrestrial histories and secrets had been written upon the outside of these enormous casing blocks, as well as prophetic destinies and, and angelic mysteries, it is beneath these outer blocks where we discover additional mysteries that even in this technological world today, sages have not yet penetrated and unraveled. One of these enigmas is why and how the Great Pyramid came to be constructed of 2.5 million blocks, all weighing 2.5 tons to 70 tons in weight, with the heaviest elevated hundreds of feet high in the structure which stood to an amazing 203 levels of blocks at 454 feet high. High in the structure is the king's chamber, roofed with multiple 70-ton megaliths. Buildings today are made from human-manufactured bricks by use of machines. Because of the ease of which bricks are produced, we take for granted the extreme difficulty in making them. People today do not grasp the Herculean effort expended in the construction of the Great Pyramid. By today's modern standards, the blocks of the Great Pyramid are gigantic compared to bricks used in our structures today. Additionally, these huge blocks are carved from living stone. Not a single block was man-made, such as clay burned in a mold within a kiln. We burn clay and other materials to make bricks, and this method is ancient. Most of the standing structures around the world today, old and new, were constructed of bricks manufactured by men even as early as the Ziggurat Pyramid Temples of Babylonia. Concerning the superiority of stone quarried blocks as opposed to mud bricks structures, Herodotus relates a curious story of an Egyptian king who had a pyramid built to commemorate his own reign, a building constructed of kiln-fired bricks. And on it was cut an inscription in stone to the following effect. It said, Do not compare me to my disadvantage with the stone pyramids. Herodotus, Book 2, The Histories, 136. There are stone cities around the world in remote areas of the Yucatan, Central America, in the Andes Mountains of South America, in Mexico, along the equatorial belt through China, India, the Near East, and, and all around the Mediterranean. These truly archaic and mysterious cities provided foundations for later cultures that used the site and built over them. 
These older cities are unique in that they employed stone blocks and cyclopean building methods stacking cut stones of such size and weight that modern engineers are at a loss to explain how they accomplished these amazing feats. The common denominator between the places of great antiquity is the disturbing fact that they all appeared to have been abandoned abrupt, abruptly, having suffered a catastrophic damage. No megalithic city has remained standing. All have fallen and were reclaimed by the earth and excavated by men. Some even restored somewhat, but none maintained their original majesty. Only the great pyramids can boast this. The quarrying of millions of blocks weighing tons with a precision that only a laser could obtain, their stacking without damage, cracking fissures, the transport of the seemingly countless multitude of blocks from the quarry site, their elevation as the courses were built upward, the setting of each block into place, and then cementing them all together into one stone with an adhesive one-fiftieth of an inch thick is impossible today. It has been tried by various architects and engineers, and the feat, even at one-third the scale, was a disaster. The most baffling aspect of these blocks is the fact that the builders of the Great Pyramid employed a 0.01-inch precision on the planes of the casing blocks when a 0.25-inch plane would have been sufficient tolerance as it, as it is in modern brickwork, according to William Cordes on page 181 of Ancient Structures. This is evidence that the builders of the Great Pyramid strove for perfection. 2,000 years ago, Pliny the Elder, in his work, Natural History, under Mining and Minerals 81, remarked that concerning the Great Pyramid, no trace of the method of building these pyramids remains, and also the most significant problem is how the blocks were raised to such a great height. Many archaeologists have remarked that not even razor blades can fit between the blocks. The ultra-strong and gossamer-thin cement was applied to every stone, along all of their faces, so that 2.5 million blocks became one stone. 48 centuries has not weakened the binding between these blocks. Bonnie Gaunt in Magnificent Numbers of the Great Pyramid and Stonehenge wrote that this cement can scarcely be seen with the naked eye, and that the stones themselves will shatter before the mortar will yield. Gaunt is a researcher into the meticulous numbers and numerology of the scriptures, the gematria of biblical passages, and their relevance to the Great Pyramid. It was her discovery that this incredible monument actually identifies itself as the building of God for the Hebrew numerical value of He created is exactly 203, which we now know is the exact number of levels of blocks that make up the Great Pyramid. In fact, the level of blocks or the courses of masonry form an astonishing calendar of the last days. But readers will have to see this author's other works, Anunnaki Homeworld, When the Sun Darkens, Chronotexture, and Return of the Fallen Ones. Though we mourn the loss of the wonderful white mantle once adorning the Great Pyramid, this loss has turned into a blessing. The white limestone casing blocks had formerly concealed the inner shell of the pyramid's core masonry and hid the monument's only entrance excuse me, from prying eyes. The removal of the casing stones has revealed to us fundamental characteristics about the Great Pyramid that distinguishes it from all other known pyramidal monuments in the world. But the greatest mystery of all is that the casing blocks were even applied. These were often 16 to 20 tons, 100 inches in thickness, and none of them would have fit together so perfectly had the interior blocks been misaligned. With the structure, the immensity of the Great Pyramid, there is supposed to be noticeable defects. Two and a half million blocks. This means that the core masonry, the pyramid itself, had to be perfect before the exterior facing was applied. Anyone not baffled by this has never understood before the Great Pyramid. This had to be done and effected by an engineering science now lost to the world that perished with the deluge cataclysm. Perhaps a method of softening limestone to perfect its planes and dimensions. 
assuming that 25 men all weighing 200 pounds all use their body weight as leverage, these men would only deadlift one block. This does not consider the movement of the block, only a vertical lift. The size of the structure is only a part of its uniqueness. Enormity of the Great Pyramid the immense girth and height of the Great Pyramid cannot be adequately realized without comparisons with modern structures and areas. It is the height of a modern 40-story building, yet it is so massive that it covers a 13-acre area. Or, on another scale, it covers an area equal to seven downtown New York City blocks. This vast monument is heavier than the world's ten tallest buildings combined, and according to Nile Valley contributions to civilization, we can build 30 Empire State Buildings from the stone of the Great Pyramid. Throughout the millennia of human history, Egypt, Babylonia, Assyria, Persia, the rest of the Near and Far East up to the more modern civilizations of Byzantium, then Constantinople and now Istanbul, to the European nations, Great Britain and the United States up to 1884, the Great Pyramid was the tallest stone structure ever built in the world. In 1884, the Washington Monument was raised, which stands 555 feet, or 6,660 inches, but this is not a fair comparison because the monument is an obelisk, not having the internal passages and chambers so peculiar to the Great Pyramid. But still, atop the 555-foot monument at the apex of the Egyptian obelisk is none other than a replica of the Great Pyramid. Modern buildings are constructed with the idea of containing things, be they offices, storage areas, or housing units. The Great Pyramid was no different, but the size of the chambers and small passages within the courses of masonry compared to the enormity of the structure itself reveals that the monument is virtually solid through and through. Vine Deloria in God is Red made an excellent illustration of the impossibility of building such an edifice today. Each stone block was a task in itself, but assuming it took the original builders of the Giza monuments an entire day to set in place 20 of these blocks, it would have taken 342 years to complete the Great Pyramid. And this estimate does not take into account the actual quarrying of the blocks and transportation time, hewing the rock to precise dimensions and raising them to the courses they were to be set in. Deloria calculated that if George Washington had the fledgling nation begin this project at the rate of production in 1776, then the building would be finished in the year 2118 AD. We can more clearly understand why the ancients associated the structure to the world tree, the axis mundi that linked the heavens, the earth and the underworld. In both size and mystery, it was unparalleled. It was considered to be the center of the world, and remarkably, by drawing lines directly east-west and north-south with the Great Pyramid as the prime meridian, we find that the Great Pyramid is indeed in the center of the world's land masses, a fact easily ascertained by looking at a map. The east-west lines drawn from 30-degree parallel latitude where the Great Pyramid rests will pass over more dry land than any other possible east-west lines, just as the north-south line passes over more dry land than any other north-south longitudinal line. The association to the world tree and axis is made also because the four faces of the pyramid face the four cardinal directions of north, east, south, and west. The structure geometrically is a wonderful three-dimensional scale of the world and a geodesic marker that identifies itself as being located exactly where on the world's surface that it is indeed found. So precise was its placement on the Giza Plateau that the variation of the magnetic needle can be determined by it. Structures built in more contemporary times at one one-hundredth of the scale have not been this precise. 
The sheer size and weight of the structure, its cardinal alignments, perfect symmetry and craftsmanship, and geographical placement hint of an intelligent design far beyond the capacities of ancient and modern man. Its 52 degree surface angle maintained at such an astonishing height, enduring 48 centuries without collapse, reveals that it was intended to last, to survive whatever natural phenomena occurred, be it storms, earthquakes, or even floods. Though this enigmatic building has never been matched among all the structures erected by the kingdoms of men, there are pyramids all around the world that prove by their own existence just how incredible this monument truly is. Relics from the Age of Replication There are over 350 pyramids around the world. There are thousands of ruinous mounds beneath jungle growth, desert sands, found underwater in lakes and rivers and off of coastlines, many of which could have once been pyramids or pyramidal structures. In Egypt alone are concentrated the most of these ruinous piles of collapsed pyramids. There are between 75 to 80 of these heaps in Egypt, some of them largely intact, but there appears to be only one place where true pyramids are found at Giza. The Egyptian and deeper African pyramids were inferiorly put together, most having collapsed because their builders attempted to amass huge piles of rock refuse as filler. They piled up boulders, dirt, and rocks and sometimes broken architecture from earlier structures into large piles that they then attempted to build on top of or cover with facing stones. This method has never served as anything other than a temporary way of, erect of erecting outwardly impressive monuments with very short structural durations. After a decade or a century of settling and subsidence, the structure then loses its shape. Weight is shifted, internal instabilities occur, and the edifice collapses. Such is the story, uh, such is the story of the ancient Nile civilization and its perplexed architects. Men sought to please their regents with visually impressive pyramidal monuments, and for a while, throughout the life of the pharaoh, the ruse worked. But after the passage of time, the monuments crumbled to obscurity that we see throughout Egypt today. The Greeks were they who first called the people of the Nile Valley by the name of Egyptians. Originally, they were called the people of Kemet. When these early Africans initially found these gigantic pyramids, they thought they were the magnificent tombs housing the bodies of great kings or gods, and as their own culture progressed, they attempted to replicate these colossi for their own rulers. The pyramids built by the people of Kemet at Saqqara, Abusur, Dashur, and dispersed throughout Upper and Lower Egypt and to the south of Nubia never achieved even a fraction of the mastery and engineering that was required for the Gazean artifacts. The various construction methods employed in the now dilapidated ruins that were intended to be pyramids expose for us today the fact that there never really existed any uniform method of pyramid construction known by the Egyptians, and nor could there have been. With the Giza pyramids encased within 100-inch thick white limestone blocks, hard as marble, the early Egyptian copyists had to guess at how these gigantic buildings were erected. Had they have been aware that the inside of the monument was built of millions of gigantic blocks of precise dimensions and phenomenal planes in 203 levels all cemented together with an adhesive 1 50th of an inch thick, then these architects might not have attempted to replicate them, or at least opted to try to copy them more accurately than by using unstable rubble or the more temporal mud bricks. The fact that rubble was used as filler also demonstrates that the ancient Egyptians did not originally have any knowledge of the Great Pyramid's internal passage and chamber system. So difficult was the replication process that many pyramids in Egypt were never finished, some having collapsed during construction or were laid so incorrectly that their builders became too exasperated to complete the work. The Egyptian pyramids are from 1,000 to 1,500 years younger than the Giza pyramids, and they are crumbled, collapsed, sinking from unequal weight distribution, and are overall visually unremarkable, whereas the Great Pyramid Complex is still intact even after having its casing blocks purposely removed.
even though the internal structure was, uh, has undergone stress fissures from subsidence of upper levels, the unimaginable weight of the mass has not sunk an inch in 48 centuries. The greatest architectural achievements of the ancient Egyptians were the temple complexes and palaces of Saqqara, Abusur, Darshur, Memphis in Lower Egypt, near the Great Pyramid Complex around the Delta, Amarna between the Lower and Upper Egypt, and those of Luxor, Karnak, at the metropolis of Waset, which is more popularly known by its Greek name of Thebes, and Dendera, Edfu, Nakata, and Abydos in Upper Egypt. Also, we must include the Valley of the Kings and the enormous canal works along the Nile. The Egyptians can be credited with these, with these as important and artistic achievements of their culture. However, these are no more impressive than the magnificent ruins at Knossos in Crete, the Lion's Gate Fortress in Mycenae, the majestic walls, palaces, temples, and ziggurat pyramids of Babylon. At Angkor Wat in Cambodia, what historians call Mohenjo-Daro of the old Harappan civilization bordering India and Pakistan, the ruins of Sumer, Baalbek in Lebanon, and over in the Americas we find the equally impressive ruins of Cuzco, Tiwanaku, Palenque, Teotihuacan, Chichen Itza, Tenochtitlan in Mexico. Truthfully, some of the Egyptian piles of architecture are an embarrassment compared to the relics left behind in Asia Minor, the Aegean, and Europe. The temples, canals, and palaces of the Egyptians were awesome edifices because they were original designs and projects, not attempts to replicate pre-existing structures. Many of their pyramids were mud brick buildings and not made of quarried stone. Stone carved out of living rock has a longevity that mud brick constructions cannot equal. This is especially true when using mud brick as filler. The step pyramids of Saqqara and the 12th dynasty pyramid of, of Amenhotep I are a testament to early Egypt's lack of knowledge in pyramid construction concerning the use and the benefits of living rock. Amenhotep the first even had his pyramid filled with rubble from old kingdom buildings. In fact, unlike as with so many other feats of Egyptian engineering, not one architectural tablet or writing has ever been discovered depicting how pyramids were constructed. When one thinks of Egypt today, the image of pyramids automatically comes to mind. However, the Egyptian pyramids outside the Giza complex are not only inferior to these, they are not even comparable to those found on the other side of the world. There are pyramids on other continents of much more elaborate design and enduring construction in the Americas. Monuments that provide us convincing and cogent evidence that their builders not only retained an intimate knowledge of pyramid construction methods, but they were also familiar with the idea embodied in the pyramid's orig origin and purpose. In North and South America are scores of magnificent and wholly preserved pyramids that have received very little attention by serious historians of the more classical civilizations. These pyramids were made of living rock. Because of this, they have survived millennia, even though the cityscapes around them have not. These areas have been covered by dense jungles and forests. The more famous of these pyramid sites in the Western Hemisphere are Machu Picchu, Tiwanaku in South America, Cholulu, Teotihuacan, Tenochtitlan in Mexico, and those of the Yucatec region in Central America like Chichen Itza, and even a particularly ancient pyramid at an Olmec site, and those of North American Valley between Ohio and Mississippi. Except for the pyramids at Giza, there are pyramids in the Americas far larger than any of those erected by the Egyptians. Also, there are pyramids in the Americas in the most unusual places. High in the Andes Mountains in Bolivia is a ruinous city largely carved out of a mountain called Tiwanaku. No one knows who built the city, but archaeologists and geologists affirm that it was once a port city, but it had been thrust 12,000 feet into the sky. Breathing at times can be an onerous task, and the region is infertile due to the high altitude and climate. 
When the Spanish explorers and conquistadors explored the unusually preserved ruins, they were told by the Inca that the city was already present when their ancestors migrated to these lands. Incredibly, even at this isolated locale stands at Tiwanaku an old pyramid called Lucumara. The famous city of the Aztecs outside Mexico City called Tenochtitlan, and you have to forgive me for my pronunciation, my American friends, is actually a city built many times over. The Aztecs took up residence in it long after they claimed that the Toltecs before them had lived there. They regarded these Toltecs as gigantic men who were very intelligent and knew all the secrets of astronomy and the earth sciences. The extensive ruins boast many intriguing pyramidal structures and temples, but the real mystery is why these people called the city Tenochtitlan. This word is a compound epithet conjoining to send a messenger, Titlan, with Tenoch. The latter is also a conjoined term, meaning the man, T-E, Enoch. The title Tenochtitlan carries with it the idea as place of the messenger Enoch. Though this was not the ori original name of the unknown city, it was precisely what the Aztecs called it. This could have only been as a result of a careful preservation of ancestral memories and their correspondence to pyramids which were founded at Tenochtitlan, which could have been brought over by Christian missionaries or been original traditions. The Aztec glyph for Tenoc was a seven-pointed cactus emerging from a stone. The cactus is the na Native American symbol for the pillar, and interestingly, it is the desert equivalent to a tree. The cactus was a suitable symbol linking the idea of the deity, in this case Tenoc, having the power of life and death with the icon of the pillar. As found in the ruins of Tenochtitlan was a 135-foot high pyramid with two temple structures at its summit that architecturally identify the twin pillar concept, linking it to the Great Pyramids of Giza. This is the Great Temple of, of Tenochtitlan, and discovered within it was the stone effigy of Huhu Teotaro. Believe me, I cannot pronounce this word. He is the old fire god. The connection to fire is almost as amazing as the eye motif upon the effigy so consistent with pyramid findings all around the world. The greatest of all pyramids in the Americas in sheer mass are found in the ruins of Teotihuacan in Mexico where the pyramids of the sun and moon dwarf the surrounding structures. This is an extensive plain full of ruins, but its history is obscure, so old that the Spanish conquistadors found the city already buried and the pyramids appeared as hills covered in shrubs and trees. The Aztecs considered the site holy and refused to disturb it. To them it was regarded as the birthplace of the gods and they had no recollection as to who built it or when it was destroyed. On the entire face of the earth, there is not another ancient architectural site that so closely parallels the Giza complex in Egypt. This site is on the opposite side of the world from Egypt, but it was built with the specific purpose of mirroring the architectural traits of the three great pyramids in Egypt. At Giza, there is an optical illusion that has caused much confusion from those that are not in the know. The specialist literature always refers to the Great Pyramid, but all those who have seen it in books, pictures, video, or visually from a distance see two Great Pyramids. This is a clever optical illusion causing the beholder to believe both of these pyramids are identical when they are not. There is only one Great Pyramid and it stands 203 courses high upon a plateau, but the one next to it, thought to be its twin, is actually elevated on an artificial platform foundation that makes it look bigger than it actually is. In the ancient Mexican counterpart, we find this exact reduplication. The Pyramid of the Sun is gigantic, but instead of being 203 levels of blocks, it is 203 feet high, filled with smaller bricks and rubble. Though it is much larger 
than the Pyramid of the Moon, the latter is upon a raised platform to make it appear equal with the former. Such a coincidence can only be traced back to some arcane and forgotten tradition mankind shared thousands of years ago, or perhaps the builders of the Stone City Complex in America had actually visited Giza sometime in the dim obscurity of Earth's past. Though this is an interesting idea, there is yet another possibility to consider. It will be recalled that the historian Flavius Josephus specifically mentioned that there were two areas constructed before the flood by the Sethites because they feared that one site might be destroyed in the flood. Though this association seems purely conjectural, we must recall that the site was initially buried. Also discovered at Til Tuacan was an intricate mural of a dragon serpent lording over two trees with seven branches. These no doubt symbolize the primordial tree of life and the tree of knowledge. Again, notice the prominent eye motif. This serpent dragon has a protruding tongue which denotes the power of speech. A talking serpent among two divine trees with seven branches below an accentuated eye symbol bespeak of closer ancestral ties with the ancient Near East than most scholars will readily admit. Probably the great artifact out of, out of the Americas relative to our study is that gigantic stone disc known as the Aztec calendar stone or the stone of the fifth sun. This mysterious 24-ton relic is an archaic Mexican apocalypse or book of revelation hewn out of rock. Comets, floods, disasters, fires, and calendrical motifs all encircle the epicenter which depicts a face with a sword protruding from its mouth, just as the revelation text reads that out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that, that with it he should smite the nations. We should not be surprised to find that the stylized symbol for doomsday on the calendar stone looks like two crossed bars with a pyramid and an eye symbol. These ideas did not derive from the Spanish, but were already existing in the New World before the Western European nations began their exploration and colon colonization campaigns. The Americas are not without their poorly made pyramids as well. In Mexico stands the Cholulu Pyramid at 215 feet high, but it has a mass covering 45 acres. Except in height, it is bigger than the Great Pyramid in Egypt, but it is inferior. It is a heap of earth and rubble covered in bricks, not solid masonry. The pyramids in the Ohio Mississippi Valley are not true pyramids either. They're more like gigantic mounds of earth and debris where vast remains of a strange character have been unearthed. The American pyramids seem to be much older than their Egyptian counterparts. Some even had limestone facing, as did the Gazean structures. In some areas, it has been found that pyramids were built over older pyramids, which were in turn built upon the foundations of even older structures. In Volume 1 of Lord McCartney's Travels, we read, In both Americas, it is a matter of inquiry what was the intention of the natives when they raised so many artificial pyramidal hills, several of which appear to have served neither as tombs, nor watchtowers, nor the base of temples. This is an interesting comment, and one that Egyptologists have avoided like a plague, not wanting to compromise the sanctity of their ridiculous pyramid tomb theory. Most of the American pyramids are astronomically aligned with associations with the planet Venus and the four cardinal directions. Uh, both the Earth Near Eastern cult both the early Near Eastern cultures and the ancient and more contemporary Americas venerated Venus and carefully recorded its movements through the heavens. The pyramids throughout America are in common with those of Egyptian ones outside the Gizan complex in that they did not have interior upper ascendant passages and chambers within their construction as does the Great Pyramid. Many have entrances that descend under the pyramids into chambers, natural rock recesses, well or cisterns. 
The Great Pyramid was long ago known to have an entrance, and it was known that this descending passage went down to a well pit beneath the pyramid. Civilizations around the world that erected pyramidal structures copied this concept, but remarkably, no one built pyramids with ascending passages and upper chambers, which makes the Great Pyramid a unique pyramid among the many. It was about 12 centuries ago that modern men first learned that the Great Pyramid had these unusual features. Long after the Egyptians ceased erecting their own versions and too isolated away from the American cultures which was still building. This is conclusive evidence that the Great Pyramid was the original, the one of a kind. Such is the principal tenet of Freemasonry, that the Great Pyramid is the archetype. The original and all other pyramids are merely subsequent constructions. It was the first of pyramids, and at the rate by which the others are deteriorating, it will be the last as well. The Alpha and Omega of Pyramids the fact that the entrance to the Great Pyramid remained hidden for thousands of years does not imply that it remained hidden from human memory. Secret Door to Giza In the Coptic traditions preserved by the Arab historian Masaudi, we learn that the pyramids of Giza had a secret entrance. And these accounts give precise measurements in cubits as to the location of the hidden door. This door was designed to yield with the slightest pull, having been ingeniously counterbalanced. But even the force of the flood and hundreds of thousands of tons of pressure could not force it open. One of the ancient Egyptian mystery cults highly venerated Amenta, or the Hidden Underworld, which was associated to the Hidden One, named Amen, a primordial deity that is mentioned in the older writings of the Book of the Dead. This priest sect closely guarded the secret of the hidden entrance of the Great Pyramid, called the Door of the Stone. Over a hundred years ago, the historian of Egyptian antiquities, Gerald Massey, wrote in his monumental work, Ancient Egypt, Light of the World. The entrance to the Great Pyramid was covered by means of a movable flagstone that turned on a pivot that none but the initiate could detect. This, when tilted up, revealed a passage four feet in breadth and three and a half feet in height into the interior of the building. This was the mode of entrance applied to Amenta as the blind doorway that was represented by the secret portal and the movable stone of later legends. The means of entrance through what appeared to be a blank wall was by knowing the secret of the nicely adjusted stone. The initiates and sages of Egyptian mysteries truly believe that the Great Pyramid contained a secret entrance to the underworld. All around the world, from cultures of great antiquity and diversity, it appears that the universal motive was that there was indeed an entrance to the world below our own, a world of the blessed and righteous dead, and a portal that led to it. However, in this case, it is intriguing to find that the Egyptians believed that this entrance was at the Great Pyramid in Giza. A rationally thinking Egyptian would not have placed such a doorway into another world in any monument that he knew was made by his own countrymen. He would have assumed that this mystic locale would have been made in a sacred place that was older than that of his own people and culture as well as their monuments. And this is exactly what we find the world over concerning the cultures that migrated to newer lands to discover stone cities and huge pyramidal structures still intact among devastated ruins. These structures were immediately associated to the underworld and its gates. The oldest civilizations on this world had a, in common a core belief of the erection of a world pillar which served as the epicenter of creation that connected the three worlds of heaven, of earth, and the underworld. All of the pyramidal buildings in the Americas have attendant legends and lore passed down from the indigenous Native Americans concerning their links to the other worlds through these structures. But the greatest link yet discovered is not quite a tale. It is an old petroglyph. 
In North America, a Hopi petroglyph has been discovered that conveys an astonishing belief. One so old it is unremembered even by the Hopi who still protect it. It concerns an arcane theology involving the ascent to heaven and the likening of this ascent to the image of a pyramid, an artificial mountain with a secret entrance, an entrance only accessible through a god. A picture of this petroglyph is found in the book titled Book of the Hopi. In Lost Scriptures of Giza, I show a facsimile of this petroglyph. Modern archaeologists and historians sometimes have a very warped way of reasoning and a view of the world around us when comparing it to that of the ancients. One example of this is the fact that scholars measure the cultures of old America by the standards of Western histories that, that of the development of the Near East. They assume, for instance, that because a people may have been nomadic, pastoral, or in a primitive condition, that this people's mode of communication would have been primitive as well. We are learning today that this is not the case. The ability of a people to become civilized and learn how to communicate using a script language based off of verbal components does not in any way exhibit that culture's superiority concerning communication ability. In fact, the script writings we use today are inferior to the ancient pictographic modes of communication utilized by the ancients beginning with the Sumerians. We think in pictures, and it's fair to assume that we would be better off writing using the, using the same pictures. As a culture, the Hopi are extinct. Those still claiming Hopi are the descendants of those who were once a populous civilization. These were a people who still communicated in the oldest form known to man, by pictures. The Hopi petroglyphs seen here belong to the Deep Well clan, who claimed that the black square seen within the pyramid petroglyph signified that there was a secret crypt inside the pyramid. There is no known historical evidence that the Hopi had ev ever built a pyramid or lived in any region of the Americas where pyramids had been erected. This memory must be ascribed to an elder tradition beyond their ability to recall. Preserving these pictures in the form of petroglyphs has greatly contributed to the longevity of these traditions. Of immense significance is that this particular petroglyph was preserved by the Deep Well clan. This identifies the third link to Giza. First is the pyramid motif. Second is the fact that it contains a secret chamber or vault associated to a crypt. Third is the preservation by the Deep Well clan, which infers that they also remembered or were supposed to that, the under, that underneath the pyramid was a well of uncertain depth at Giza. The Hopi interpretation of the secret crypt may be true, referring to an as-yet-undiscovered burial crypt somewhere inside the gigantic edifice. The old Hebraic traditions claim that both Adam and Seth were buried inside the pyramid complex, Seth having died in the 52nd year of the construction of the Great Pyramid. The secret vault may refer to the previously undiscovered ascendant passages that led up to the Grand Gallery in the areas now called the Queen's and the King's Chamber. The mysterious King's Chamber contained the granite sarcophagus, though it was known that it never contained a burial. While these are possible alternatives, they are not probable as an explanation for the black square's proximity on the exterior of the pyramid attached to the facing blocks of the petroglyphic pyramid. The location of the black square is most likely the secret entrance into the Great Pyramid, which is not on the surface level of the plateau, but located high up on the face of the structure, about 50 feet on the northern face. Additionally, the petroglyphic pyramid's facing blocks are discovered as if they were painted or they had writing on them. The final piece of this stunning mystery in North America is the name the Hopi gave to the village where this petroglyph was preserved and guarded. It is called Winnema, or The Way Home. This extinct culture faithfully preserved a divine secret committed to their trust eons ago. 
Their distant ancestors knew that the way home was by ascending the steps of the pyramid that contained a secret entrance that was only accessible through a deity who served as a gate or a doorway into this other realm. This door and the ascending corridors of the Great Pyramid were specifically designed by the antediluvian Sethite builders by their instructions of Enoch. The door was to remain hidden until a certain designated time in the future after historical events unfolded that were prophesied to occur before the flood. These events transpired long after the deluge. Though the myriad traditions from the old world survived concerning this hidden door and the descendant passages that led to the well underneath the structure, it was the knowledge of the ascendant passages and chambers that remained unknown throughout the entire history of mankind until recently. Over 12 centuries ago, an Arab expedition led by the Caliph of Baghdad, which you know of as Babylon, his name was Al-Mamon. He traveled to Egypt and camped at the foot of the Great Pyramid. They had come for treasures rumored to be hidden within the structure. Others had attempted to tunnel into the structure, but they had given up. The limestone, hard as marble, marble was a deterrent for thousands of years from would-be treasure seekers. Abdullah Al-Mamon was a unique ruler. He was a scholar and learned in the traditions of his people, the Copts, Egyptians, and Greeks. He was an intellectual and a collector of accounts about the Great Pyramid. There is every possibility that this builder and innovator was in possession of many of the old writings taken from the Alexandrian Library centuries before. The stories he amassed concerning the historical reference to objects hidden within the Great Pyramid and Giza complex before the flood were quite remarkable. With a sizable force of engineers, scholars, and laborers, he set to the task of tunneling into the massive building in the desert, having promised every man a share of the discovered treasure. There is evidence that this genius never intended on finding any treasures, but was there, was there out of a burning curiosity to learn more about the Great Pyramid. But there's more on this later. The Great Pyramid was in 820 AD just as majestic and imposing as it had been 26 centuries earlier during the life of Abraham. A white, adorned, gleaming mountain that was so perfect in its geometrical dimensions and placement that it appeared as an otherworldly construction amid the golden desert sands. Under the direction of al Mamon, the laborers tunneled into the granite hard casing blocks, employing various techniques to compromise the integrity of the stone. They eventually penetrated the white limestone casing blocks only to find gigantic limestone internal core blocks of almost equal density. They persevered, though grudgingly. Though the men under his command with every, with every dozen feet grew more and more bitter and distraught, believing the structure solid through and through, al Mamon ur urged them on. It was at the point of giving up that something miraculous happened. As the despairing men chiseled and hammered their way into the mountain of blocks, a sudden dull thud was heard inside the structure. Something heavy had fallen down. The news spread quickly, and al Mamon and his men furiously tunneled in the direction that the men supposed was the source of the sound. Though hope was renewed, al Mamon's position was volatile. So much labor for so long had, been, had produced nothing. The men worked in shifts, aiming for the supposed hollow. When they finally broke through, they found themselves in a tunnel within the Great Pyramid with absolutely perfect planes that had been sealed off from human wandering and scrutiny since before the flood. al Mamon had discovered the Great Pyramid's ascending passage hitherto unknown to mankind. Only by the agency of traditions was it known that upper passages and chambers existed in the Great Pyramid, but for thousands of years, the Egyptians and other cultures only knew of the pyramid's descending passage. The discovery proves that the Great Pyramid is the original one and that all other pyramidal monuments around the world are merely replicas. 
No other pyramids in the world copied these ascendant passages and chambers in the upper reaches of the structure because no one had ever been inside the upper area of the Great Pyramid during those thousands of years when men were on in the world building pyramids. The Arab and Egyptian workers soon learned the source of the loud thud that had attracted their attention. Their hammering had caused vibrations sufficient enough to dislodge a massive stone slab that had been concealed in the ceiling blocks of the descending corridor. The granite plug was disguised as a ceiling block inserted into the roof of the passage. When the Egyptians investigated the interior of the Great Pyramid and took note of the descending passage, uh, subterranean chamber, and well pit below, they walked right under this hidden entrance without ever knowing about it and transmitting the knowledge to other pyramid-building peoples. None of the pyramids throughout Egypt replicate this wonderful feature. The Arabic account holds that they tunneled up and around the granite plugs, a series of three of them, to open up the ascendant passage, according to David Davidson in The Great Pyramid, its divine message, on page 178. He wrote this a century ago. It was then hidden. It was then this hidden entrance that prevented the engineers around the world from copying the totally one-of-a-kind tunnel and chamber system of the Grand Gallery, the Queen's Chamber, the Antechamber, the King's Chamber with its several relieving chambers inside the building. The pyramid civilizations as far as the Americas knew of the descending passage with its underground chamber and well, and they faithfully replicated these features. It is certain that had they have known about the ascendant passages and chambers, they would have copied these architectural features as well. For the world pillar, the axis mundi, or navel of the world, was central to all of their most ancient cosmological traditions. The existence of these upper reaches within the Great Pyramid was a secret maintained by the Sethites that died before the Deluge, a secret probably passed down through the lineage of the survivor Noah and his son Shem, patriarch of the Semitic peoples, which later fell into Abraham's possession, a direct descendant of Shem. In fact, Shem outlived Abraham and personally tutored him, a man born 100 years prior to the cataclysm when human longevity was measured in centuries rather than decades. The incredible lifespans of the ancients is the subject matter of return of the fallen ones. By 820 AD, even the secret location of the entrance of the Great Pyramid had become lost. It was this expedition that reclaimed it. The Arabs explored the interior of the Great Pyramid, venturing down the long subterranean passage to the chamber underneath the structure, deep inside the limestone plateau, and found the well pit blocked off by debris. Remember that Herodotus, twelve and a half centuries before this, wrote that the Egyptians maintained that the well was deep and that it, fl that it flooded from the waters of the Nile. Nothing of value was discovered in the descending passage, so they turned their attention to exploring the mysterious upper areas. The Arabian explorers now searched the areas come to be called the Grand Gallery, the Queen's Chamber, the Antechamber, and the King's Chamber. These are not the true names of the architectural places which are now lost to us, and nor did Al Mamon's men find anything inside the Great Pyramid. Though no treasures were found, these men made the discovery of the millennium. They walked and beheld chambers no humans had seen in over 36 centuries. One of the most profound discoveries concerning the interior upper passages and chambers was not made by the Arabic engineers, but by modern researchers. Salt crystals have been found exuding from the limestone rock from the surfaces of the Queen's Chamber, access passage, and the lower half of the Grand Gallery. These have now been cleaned out, but their presence was recorded by many men who had explored the interior in the last four centuries. These crystals were found to have fossilized microorganisms like protozoa and plankton from the ocean. This was a significant find and one consistent with what we know about the Giza Plateau. The common thread concerning traditions about the Great Pyramid is that it was under the ocean for a period of time. 
In the scriptures, we learn that the world was completely underwater for a year. In my own work, Return of the Fallen Ones, I show that the location of the Great Pyramid Complex was unknown after the deluge until 340 years after the cataclysm when a mighty earthquake rocked northern Egypt. This quake was caused by the raising of the Giza Plateau out of the southern Mediterranean Sea that created the unusual delta. Egypt was originally called the Raised Land. The original Egyptian civilization was centered hundreds of miles south around Waset, Thebes. After the quake, the raised delta area, the Nile River runoff created in a flash of seawater created several rivers. The Egyptians found that there were now another 108 miles further from the coast. This new Mediterranean coast is the one we know today. Several travelers, geographers, and archaeologists over the years of Giza exploration have noted the abundance of seashells lying everywhere around the Great Pyramid complex. How the salt water seeped into the Great Pyramid is a mystery, and this author will not presume to know how. For salt crystals to have appeared in abundance, then this indicates a long time immersed, and because the Queen's Chamber and the lower half of the Grand Gallery were full, then the structure would have had, would have had evaporating water for centuries. The residual crystals are evidence of this. The facts that no salt crystals have ever been found in the subterranean chamber and passage system reveals that the three granite plugs that blocked the entrance to the ascendant passage were watertight. These were the ones that were removed by Almamon's crew. The salt incrustation was half an inch thick on the lower grand gallery walls and the queen's chamber, according to William Cordes in Ancient Structures on page 194. He further remarks that archaeologists are hard put to explain how the limestone core blocks of the Great Pyramid retain so much dense moisture content when the limestone plateau and area around Giza is so arid. He too postulates that the pyramid was under the sea. Inside the king's chamber, the Arabs found only an empty granite box properly known as the sarcophagus. Nothing was found inside of it, no bones, no relics from an ancestral burial, no evidence of anything, nor anything even remotely Egyptian. Though this is allegedly the container of some historic ruler, according to the Egyptological model, this stone box was found empty. But an incredible mystery lies within. The king's chamber is a mine of enigmas. The architecture is megalithic and imposing. Above this is the relieving chamber, composed of several vaults divided by slabs weighing 70 tons each. One seeking to enter the king's chamber must pass through the antechamber, and in so doing, he must bow or kneel in order to pass underneath the granite leaf. Only by this act can one walk into the majestic perfection of the king's chamber. The Arabs under al Mamon found no writings here and no evidence of any treasure, but this does not infer that there are no messages conveyed within this most holy place. The very architecture itself, its arrangement and geometrical alignments are patterned in divine revelations. So many astounding truths are found in the architecture of this structure and the correspondences between geometrical alignments and historical calendars and timelines that I have provided them in my series on YouTube, The Lost Secrets of Giza. The only piece of furnishing in the in the king's chamber is the granite sarcophagus, a massive stone box resting on a truly coloss colossal slab of rock that serves as the floor of the king's chamber, a massive foundation. One of the most disturbing discoveries concerning this granite coffin-sized box is the fact that it could have never been brought into the room. The doorway is too small to admit the sarcophagus. This means that the sarcophagus was lowered from above as the structure was still being built. This empty box tells a silent story about something that was supposed to be inside it, perhaps a body, but is not. Without a lid, the box does not have the power to contain. The four corners of the sarcophagus correspond to the four corners of the chamber itself, providing us the sum of eight, the number of new beginnings. 
eight stones cover each end of the chamber and 16 the sides. The number eight is significant in relation to the earthly time cycle known as the week. The eighth day is the first of the next series of seven, a new beginning. Eight was represented by a symbol having no beginning and no end. As the terminus defining a seven-day week and also the first day of the next seven days that would make another week, the number eight was the alpha and omega of numbers. Since terrestrial time is measured in sevens, days, years, 70-day or year periods, and the prophetic seven ages of mankind, the number eight signifies the concept of rebirth and renewal. The silent message screaming out from the architecture of the antechamber and the king's chamber concerns one who was killed but is not dead, one who is accessible to the humble, one who has left death behind, who heralds a new beginning to all those who ascend in their journey to seek him out. The king's chamber could more correctly be rendered the chamber of man's inheritance. It is the chamber that another mystery unfolds. On the southern face of the king's chamber is a small shaft like a telescopic tube cut precisely through 200 foot of stone, through scores of courses of limestone blocks. The ingenuity required for this laser precision shaft defies the imagination when considering the fact that the shaft was cut into the blocks before they were laid in place and not after the courses of blocks were set. This makes these blocks especially difficult to fashion their architects seemingly inhuman. Today, only lasers could replicate this feat. Archaeoastronomers claim that this shaft was originally designed to pinpoint the three belt stars of Orion, Alnitak, Saif, and Rigel. Orion was a type of messianic figure to the ancients. The oldest rendering of the epithet is Urion, meaning drawn from the water. Orion was the coming prince, and as a constellation, it is the most brilliant in the heavens. It has become a very popular theory that the three largest pyramids at Giza, the Great Pyramids, are aligned geometrically to match the three belt stars of Orion's belt. Perhaps the theory is older than we think. The Arabian writer Edin bin Yawda long ago wrote that each of the Gizean monuments was consecrated to a star. Opposite the shaft in the king's chamber is the one extending from the antechamber and points into the northern heavens at the ancient pole star Alpha Draconis, or Eye of the Dragon. Alpha Draconis is far from the zodiacal concentrations, con excuse me, constellations, and it appears to be lording over all the other stars because it was the celestial pivot a star that did not move as the rest of the starry host slowly revolved around it. When entering the antechamber, one must turn around and look behind them to see the shaft. Since 1859, several attempts have been made by serious researchers to demonstrate that the internal architectural measurements of the Great Pyramid are an encoded timeline of the history and future of the world. Unfortunately, not one of these men had an exact chronology to work with and some manipulated historical dates to conform to internal rectilinear measurements within the monuments to fit their preconceptions into their design. Others did not have exact architectural measurements, so their dates did not matter anyway. These men were driven with a passion to exhibit this phenomenon because they were inspired to know it by intuition, by the spirit, but not by its particulars. For any who disbelieve that this Enochian superstructure is in fact a gigantic prophetic calendar of the world, then they must see the videos that I have, I have shown on my YouTube channel in the playlist, The Lost Secrets of Giza. Using only Sir Flinders Petrie's measurements that were conducted to the thousandths of an inch, I show in multitudes of charts the awe-inspiring fact that the descending passage, subterranean chamber, well pit, ascending passage, queen's chamber, grand gallery, antechamber, and king's chamber have all been accurately scientifically measured in minute detail and that these measurements conform exactly to a rectilinear timeline that we call world history. The Great Pyramid, a three-dimensional calendar of the future. 
But because we are now over 48 centuries into its prophetic chronology, we can easily see in retrospect how definitively perfect these arrangements are. By turning backward, one looks into the past. This is what one must do to see the shaft formerly hidden in the antechamber. To the ancient mindset, one looked into the past if they looked backwards. This was the chief trespass of Lot's wife when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Though they were spared as a family, despite the fact that the inhabitants were left behind to die a fiery fate, she, dispo, dispo, excuse me, she disobeyed the command and turned backwards to see the cities as they were destroyed. She could not let go of the past. Her body was burned so fast as she stood in a field of salt from the Dead Sea that she mineralized turned into an instant fossil composed of salt crystal as organic tissue was replaced with minerals absorbed from the environment. Hebraic records found at this location among the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the Book of Enoch refer to Azazel, an evil angel that before the flood was guilty of polluting the heavens for, in for inducing men on earth to see that which was behind them. This infers that the dark angel appeared to ancient men and taught them the forbidden knowledges and science that caused the ruin of former generations. This belief is traced back as far as the 3rd millennium BC among the Akkadians, preceded only by the Sumerians. The Akkadians claim that humanity was originally blameless until tempted by the dragon of the deep. Prior to this deception, the dragon was the divinely appointed keeper of time, the epicenter of the starry motion, and inside the dragon constellation was the eye of the dragon, the antediluvian pole star. There are Hebrew traditions that link Azazel to another name, Shemyaza, who is judged by Orion and eternally bound for revealing the name of God to mortal women. As will be seen, these traditions are all linked to the secrets of the Great Pyramid. In the most primitive and remote cultures around the world, the dragon was noted long ago to be the appointed guardian and keeper of hidden treasures on the mountain of the gods, the mount that interchanges with the tree. The dragon archaically symbolizes divine kingship, and this concept is as old as Sumer and Babylonia. After the Diluvian disaster, it became a prevalent tradition which was carried all around the world. Even in China, their first dynasty were the Dragon Kings. The Aztec mural excavated from Teotihuacan with the dragon with a large eye hovering over two trees is merely one of thousands of examples of this idea spread throughout antiquity. In Genesis, we find the beginning of a dragon as a serpent that deceived mankind, a serpent that, as a terrestrial king, becomes a dragon with seven heads toward the last days and the dragon's reign. Probably the oldest recorded story of the dragon before the deluge was discovered upon tablets in the famous Assyrian library of Ashurbanipal. He was also called the Twisted Serpent because of its snake-like appearance in the heavens, a string of stars forming the Draco constellation, which was even mentioned in the Book of Job. The importance of the dragon ended with the flood because of, of the worldwide change. Our axis pointed at Alpha Draconis prior to the deluge, but after the catastrophe ended, the survivors noticed immediately that there was a whole new starry order and that the dragon had fallen. Now the axis had shifted and pointed at the great bear, Ursa Major, which was the new pole star. The flood that destroyed the world's civilizations was by no means a mere flooding of the land. It was worldwide cataclysm. Though this book cannot cover all the details and literature concerning this tragic end-time event in ancient humanity's past, here is a very concise summary of what occurred. The full accounts are in my other works, When the Sun Darkens and Return of the Fallen Ones, Nostradamus and the Planets of Apocalypse and Anunnaki Homeworld, and Shocking Secrets of Antiquity. About the same time that a large star appeared moving in the heavens with a tail that looked like a divine sword in the sky, 
earthquake shook the cities of the world. For seven days and nights the people of the earth beheld the approaching sword and brilliant star as the foundations under their feet cracked and the animals became erratic and violent. Volcanoes erupted and pillars of fire shot high into the air and rained ash. The earth trembled unceasingly and the entire world mountain ranges sprang up as new river systems appeared in days and lakes vanished as others appeared overnight. Whole cities were disintegrated and sunk below the shaking ground while land masses were thrust upward while others buckled and were buried under new coastlines. It began raining and never stopped. The wild animals traveled in wild packs. Domesticated animals had become maddened, attacking their masters and children. As the tail of the gigantic burning star enveloped the sky, the entire sky dimmed to a dark brown or barely seen as flames burned across the sky and plasma in the upper atmosphere caused a spectacular display of lightning bolts that scattered across the darkened sky in the daytime and struck the earth in thousands of places. As the passing comet or planetary fragment entered into a full transit between the sun and earth, the daytime sky blackened like night. The stars appeared in the daytime. The moon turned the color of blood and gigantic rocks fell from the sky. One particularly colossal meteorite crashed far away and the entire world shuddered as, as the whole region we know as the Gulf of Mexico became the burning impact crater. The shock wave literally took apart the entire Western Hemisphere. The center of Sethite civilization sank below the rising tides and was buried under 40 days of rainfall. And the mighty Gihon River raging against the land, once fertile, covered in woods we call Egypt. The Giza Plateau bearing the Great Pyramid suffered subsidence and the entire shelf of North Africa was plunged into the depths of the sea we know as the Southern Mediterranean, where it would remain at the bottom for 340 years. The violent current during this year-long inundation, underwater severely damaged the Sphinx and caused deep water erosion that the pyramids encased in facing blocks did not suffer. This water erosion is the source of the erroneous theory propagated today that the Sphinx is older than the pyramids. A year later, the world was a colder place of glacial sheets miles high covering the upper northern and, and southern polar regions extending southward and northward for thousands of miles beyond the Arctic and Antarctic circles. The world was filled with mudslides, sinkholes, meltwater seas that created vast freshwater lakes. The world continued to settle as decomposing bodies of billions of life forms were compressed under millions of tons of earth. Entire buried land surfaces with broken forests and their occupants formed immense coal deposits and graveyards of pre-flood life forms and flora were burned by pressure, decomposition, and radioactivity. The world's oil deposits were created, as were tar pits and hollowed cavities deep under the ground had filled with natural gases like methane as the world that once was decayed, fossilized, became gaseous, bitumen, coal, oil, and other fossil fuel byproducts. The entire pre-flood world and its once thriving civilization vanished and the topography of the whole world was altered. It was literally turned upside down. The whole world of the vapor canopy vegetation vanished. It was this worldwide cataclysm that caused the earth to tilt and move its axis away from the eye of the dragon. The approach of this object, known to the ancients as Phoenix, caused massive geomagnetic disturbances and even several reversals in rapid succession as it was direct in direct transit between our world and the sun. As the Earth was immersed within its parabola and shadow, the gravitational attraction and interference loosened the outer layers of our world. People in terror braced themselves as they saw the stars in the daytime. Then the Earth rolled, turning over to face the night side and rolled back before Phoenix pulled away and, the, and our world recalibrated. 
The equatorial bulge was created in an instant from this reshaping of the Earth's dimensions, and when it was all over, the new axis pointed at the Great Bear, for the dragon had fallen. The fact that the northern shaft in the Great Pyramid points to Polaris, the Great Bear, indicates to Gerald Massey in the 1880s that the Great Pyramid was built to demonstrate the ending of the Great Year and the final overthrow of the dragon. Such a pole shift is found in the ancient text called the Book of Noah, dispersed among the writings of the Book of Enoch. These writings claim that before the flood, the world trembled violently and the earth became inclined and destruction approached. The flood ended the reign of the dragon, which could no longer control the destinies of mankind. The Noahic flood was not the cause, but an effect of powerful, of powerful interplanetary dynamics. The other planet, not one that travels the plane of the ecliptic like the others, but seen in 1764 by astronomer Hoffman as it passed over a fifth of the sun's surface in a partial transit and was seen by people all over Europe with the naked eye. Hoffman noted, noted that it traveled on a north-to-south trajectory passing over the ecliptic. This rogue world on its 138-year orbit has been seen many times and is the topic of when the sun darkens. When Phoenix transited, it compromised the fragile mesosphere that once protected the Earth, a high-altitude water canopy that deflected harmful radioactive particles while creating a wonderful worldwide greenhouse. This water, can water vapor canopy, similar to that of Venus's, collapsed and fell to Earth, causing the flood. Genesis is very clear that prior to the flood, the entire world was watered in the morning and evening by a thick mist that emerged from the ground and that rain was unknown. The collapse of this mesosphere also caused the drastic decrease in human longevity from centuries to decades. Coupled with this was a decreased metabolic rate due to vitamin and mineral deficient foods due to the infiltration of harmful radioactive particles from the sun that the former mesosphere shielded away. Because of the reign of the dragon, the world had become inferior. It tilted like a pillar falling and the heavens, stars, and planets withdrew from the earth visually because the water vapor canopy that had been there magnifying the heavens was now gone. The removal of the mesosphere altered human biology to the molecular level, and even now the human genome retains junk DNA from those times before the deluge when we were biologically superior beings. The Great Bear is a constellation of seven stars revolving around the pole, or circumpolar. What is disturbing is the fact that these stars in no way conform to the shape of a bear, but the association to a bear animal was universally, universal among the ancients. These seven stars were a symbol of initiation into the holy mysteries of the heavenly ascent of the soul. As the ascent of the soul was required for resurrection to link to the bear, maybe due to the hibernation trait during the winter a type of death during the dead part of the year. The bear emerges in the spring as the cold dissipates in a type of rebirth. It was said long ago that bears kept watch in the stellar stories. However, as will be shown, the older beliefs are quite different as to the identity of these stars. Hindu legends claim that there exists a place on earth where the Lord of Time dwelt upon a transcendent mountain that had a summit that glowed like a tongue of fire at sunset. This is the Great Pyramid with a crystal top stone, maybe? And towards where the seven stars of the Great Bear turned their eyes. In old India, they were called the Seven Rishis. Seven powerful and ancient wise rulers in humanity's distant past that were known as the seven sons of the dragon of wisdom. Max Mueller interprets Rishi to be derived from a root meaning to shine. Before the flood, there was a dynasty remembered by the Sumerians as the seven kings. These wicked rulers began their dominion over the departure after the departure of Enoch, and they were personally responsible for creating the insane conditions and corruption that led to the judgment of God that resulted with the great flood. 
This is the subject matter of Return of the Fallen Ones. The link to the bear may have been due to a phonetic corruption among the nations of antiquity, possibly spanning back as far as the Babel Holocaust. There is evidence that an initial vowel has been worn off. Originally, the word was Arishas, and the idea behind the star group was not that of a bear, but of the plowing of the dawn. These seven stars were identified as seven plowing oxen. Phonetically, the word bear is the same as bar, or father of light. In fact, most of the elder languages had the sound of the word bear equivalent to the words for either light or fire. The Latin ursa, bear, resolves to ursa, firelight, and the Sanskrit riksha, in rishis, expands to urik isha, or fire of the great isha. Riksha means bear. These seven stars represented the gate of heaven, and for this reason do we find in Egypt depictions of a ladder tipped so as to point to the seven stars of the great bear. This faith in the divine entrance to the heavens may be why the oldest nations referred to the seven stars as the sheepfold. As pastoral societies, early man envisioned the afterlife as a state of per per uh, perpetual perfection where he no longer had to worry about mundane needs, such as food and protection from enemies, things taken care of by the shepherd of the flock. And this is the mystery between the dragon and his enemy, the shepherd, embodied within the faces and corners of the antechamber, king's chamber, and shafts. Below the king's chamber, or chamber of man's inheritance, lies the place come to be known as the queen's chamber, no extravagant grand gallery or antechamber system leads to this largely unremarkable chamber. There are two shafts that penetrate through 260 feet of stone, but they do not point at any obvious star groups. As the king's chamber concerns the incredible destiny of humankind and their redemption, the lower chamber concerns the other sentient beings in the creation the order of angels known by many names, like archons, decans, principalities, cherubim, watchers, guardians, and seraphim. What was meant for angelic comprehension was not intended for human comprehension. The angels came before humanity, and entry into the queen's chamber does not require the traveling up through historical timelines, grand gallery, antechamber, and king's chamber. The histories of the angelic orders are far more complex than the simplified explanations by theologians. Long prior to the creation of mankind, the angels were a part of an extensive civilization, multidimensional with our own solar system being the epicenter of government. The long-held misconception of men crowned in halos with white feathery wings and, and white gowns is a fiction. Angels are trans-dimensional beings able to transcend our fourth-dimensional reality because they are fifth-dimensional intelligences allowing them to move beyond both space and time. They have passions, allegiances, orders, and they have capacity to disobey them as well. The orders of the angelic hosts have taken sides in a primordial dispute between the Godhead and the first created archangel, and this led to the devastating war that destroyed worlds and billions of life forms all long before anything was ever introduced into the creation called man. Our earth is very old, with a rich history, though in the span of planetary antiquities, humanity is an infant. Humankind was never meant to be. The Godhead made man in his image having an immortal soul, but his body was designed merely as a vessel. The sarcophagus in the king's chamber is necessary because mankind was given over to death on earth, a scheme designed by his enemies, those angelic entities that rebelled and thought to make war against God through his signature creation. Though the angels were created in the beginning were never initially subjected to death, being a biological phenomenon, by their own choice did they cast their lots, lose a war, and now await the very fate they had initially planned, planned for mankind. Death. Though judgment has been delayed, it has already been declared. That the sarcophagus is empty reveals that one had already sacrificed himself for his flock. 
There are some who would object to this analysis on the basis that the angels came first and their own chamber was underneath that designated for mankind. The Great Pyramid is prophetic architecture and alludes to that which will be, not the sta state of things that are. Angelic beings indeed have deserved a status much higher than those who came later, than humans on earth, and scripturally the angels are described as greater in power and might, but this was by God's design. The story of the prodigal son is about disobedient mankind going out into the world in defiance of the father, while the other brother, Angel, stayed with the father and did everything he was supposed to. This parable was for the angels. When the defiant son returned and begged to enter his father's house, the father had a great party and a feast, gave him a robe and a ring, and was elated with his return. The faithful brother informed the father that he had never received these things, but the father replied that it had always been that they were together, but his brother, who was lost, has now returned. It is difficult for people to grasp how humans could be regarded more highly to God than his own angels because people are unaware of the truly astonishing inheritance the redeemed shall receive in the eternal future. According to the New Testament records, while on earth, we are a little lower than the angels. However, in our resurrected, glorified, and powerful bodies, we will be made in the likeness of God, receiving an eternal inheritance greater than that of the angels. In fact, Paul wrote that we will be into the position to judge angels. Angelic beings were the first sons of God, but some of them fell in distant antiquity, falling from their first estate and became evil terrestrial entities bent on corrupting mankind. Those among men who believe on him shall receive the spirit of adoption, also becoming sons of God. Created in his image, we receive a higher divine status, which is reflected in the internal architectural features of the Great Pyramid. What information we are blind to is evident to angels. The air shafts of the Queen's Chamber are mysterious to us, but we do not know what revelations they contain for angelic beings, luminaries that, according to Genesis' account, were created to be signs for those of us on the, on the earth. In the book of Enoch, we find this as a possibility. Concerning the passing of the night sky, Enoch wrote, I bless the Lord of glory, who made those great and splendid signs, the stars, that they might display the magnificence of his work to angels and to the souls of men, and that these might glory in all his works and operations, might see the effects of his powers, might glorify the great labor of his hands and bless him forever. We cannot deny that the angelic mind is one of ancient intelligence with a memory spanning back many millennia, perhaps eons before the creation of Homo sapiens and most likely with the capability of instant recall. Memory for an angelic entity would not be biologically based with the neural restrictions we possess. What information concerning their own destinies may never be known among men, but evidence that our predecessors partially knew of these secrets is found in several Enochian passages. Further, old Hebrew traditions link angels with the pyramid esoterica in that they are told that the number of the angels that originally fell from heaven and deliberately descended to earth, assuming human-like bodies, was 520. And these 520 angelic beings took the daughters of men. This 520 is a reduplication of the pyramid exterior angle of 52 by a factor of the pyramid number of 10, the tetractus. These angels lusted for human females and sexual experiences and crossed a spiritual barrier that could not be breached once passed through. These angels are forever lost and continually interfere in the affairs of men, maddened with rage and fear, judgment declared but delayed. Mankind, as redeemed, is offered the opportunity to pass through the spiritual threshold and take up the offices of those that had disobeyed, inheriting these positions through divine adoption. Over a century ago, scholars and translators of Near East texts were of the uniform opinion that the ancients believed that humanity was specifically created to fill the gap left behind from the defection of innumerable and angelic beings. 
One of these intriguing finds was the Babylonian Revolt in Heaven tablet, which reads, To those rebel gods, he prohibited their return. He stopped their service. He removed them unto the gods who were his enemies. In their room he created mankind. Such was also the teaching of the Gnostics who held that mankind would only replace those archons, decans, and principalities that rebelled, becoming a part of the inheritance of the height. This is none other than a reference to the Great Pyramid, the mysteries of resurrection embodied within its design. This sums up part two. Of, of a reading of my published book, The Lost Scriptures of Giza. As many of you noticed, when this book was written, it is very heavily Christian. And I, I wanted to preserve that in this reading, although my own personal beliefs have strayed from this. It doesn't detract from the message of the book or, or from the facts about the Great Pyramid. In both the description box and the comment section below, you will find my personal email. Ask me any questions. If you have video ideas, I'd like to hear them. And if you want to donate, all those buttons are accessible below. Playlists and everything you might need. Access to the gates to my websites. 